February 2023, we bring issue two of Living Proof Magazine, a printed magazine by Angel and Z Radio, available exclusively through our Patreon. Issue two of Living Proof Magazine features New York's l e crew, Deceive Smart Crew, Brian Anderson, 454, and Set KRT. Issue two will only be available for the month of February 2023 and will never be rerun after February. Living Proof Magazine will drop periodically throughout the year and is sent to our Patreon members. Issue two features an in-depth interview from Deceive Smart Crew with photos from Deceive's personal collection, including landmark spots that have been long since buffed. It also features a long format interview with New York's l e crew, an interview from the legendary Set KRT, sketches and writings from Brian Anderson's personal notebook, music selections from 454, and more. Living Proof Issue 2 is only available through our Patreon for the month of February 2023, will be sent to our Patreon members, and will never be rerun. Members gain access to our Patreon library featuring interviews from Ichabod YME, Dessa MTA, Curve TGE, videos like All We Got Is Us 2, Savvy OTR, Jedi Fives, You Win Some, You Lose Everything, Rain interviews from Cheek and You Won't, and more. As always, immense thank you to anybody who supports the show in any way. Enjoy the episode and peace. Hey, this is Claw Money, and you're listening to Angel and Z, sponsored by Art Primo. What is Art Primo, you ask? How dare you? Art Primo is a graffiti shop that was started by writers for writers in Seattle in 2001, and they have stayed true to their roots for over 20 years, offering everything from caps to inks to paint to refillable mops. They got nibs, they got jibs, they got caps, solids, zines, books, and more. And their how-to videos and YouTube channel are legendary. Art Primo strives to keep their prices low and quality high, hand pouring all of their mops and inks in their Seattle warehouse. Shipping orders on the same day and their site is a source of information for all types of writing tools. Tools for what? Tools for the revolution. Just got a haircut. Sweet. When did you get it? Just, I go, my barber, my barber is at Utica in Buffalo. I'm sorry, St. John in Buffalo, two blocks from Utica, Crown Heights. Go see Dane at Unity Barbers. I'll be setting every, I'll be setting all viewers up with uh, posters. Just, we'll give, we'll give you an address to mail in for a free barbershop poster, courtesy of the Angel and Z podcast. Sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, just strike that. Strike. You can strike that. Yo, thank you so much for uh, letting us here and coming on the show. It's a big honor for us. And uh, I feel like we've been talking through the DMs for a solid amount of time trying to make this happen. So I'm hyped. How how long of a time? Pretty long time. When like, do you think you con- How many episodes do you think you were in before? Before you contacted me. I don't know. We're at like what a hundred and. 120 something 150 right now like recorded 150 but actually uploaded like 120 something um and we've been in contact with you in some way shape or form for at least the past like i would say four months just through like email and then sometimes through dm and whatever so yeah hyped to do this um i guess one of the things i wanted to start talking about is like before we did this i was at home just you know listening to some of your past uh, interviews and videos that have been up on you. And uh, one of the things that struck out to me is you were talking about like purpose behind doing things. Like when you're making any type of artwork that it may be, you're kind of striving to give people something like that they can use as a source of strength, something useful that essentially like to put it into less words, something that can better people's lives uh, even if they themselves like aren't, you know, like they're not taking the art home with them, but they're, if they, even if they just see it, it changes their mindset or makes them feel like more part of like a unified whole. Right. Um, and I have a quote of something you said that I want to read later, but one of the things that I was thinking is when did this like ideology or philosophy or whatever you want to call it come to be? Was it always like that? Uh, it was not always like that. I mean, I guess I should start by saying that, you know, without putting too many definitions in place like any mark that's made is an act of creativity like full stop and long story short um i want to i'm i'm definitely for an art that's that's useful and in the the realm of making graffiti like 
when I started writing graffiti in 1984, it was a very interesting time to start writing graffiti in Philadelphia because we had a mayor that was running on a campaign and was elected on the really on the promise that he was going to eliminate graffiti. Mm. He made a, he filmed a commercial about it that ran on local television. He made it like a, the major plank of his election uh, campaign was to eliminate graffiti. And it was really at the very same moment that I aligned myself with graffiti and I felt this is the one thing in life that is means anything to me and I'm gonna like work my fingers to the bone to figure out a way to like make graffiti and you know as soon as I decided I was going to be a graffiti writer government opposition you know arrayed itself against me and you know a lot of municipalities have had the problem or have identify graffiti as some kind of problem and they have made a government agency to combat this problem but philadelphia was the first city in north america and maybe the world that had an anti-graffiti program that had like a an office with a door with a with a budget to eliminate graffiti and just by the measure of me being a young ambitious driven graffiti writer I was a known personality on their radar from, I mean, it took a couple years, but, you know, my mentality, even from the start, because there was this government opposition, my mentality was, I have to make arguments that offset their arguments. And that was probably something I learned from Chuck D. I mean, you know, he, it's kind of funny to think about, like, rap music and, you know, graffiti predates hip hop in its way. Graffiti might be the original um, element of hip hop, but as being like, you know, crossing from 87 into 88 and listening to Def Jam records, like almost exclusively. And like Chuck D, reading Chuck D, like forget about the records, the records are great, but reading Chuck D in print and Chuck D saying like, uh, he was dealing with people hating rap and people wanting to shut down rap and people wanting to like crush him time and time again. And he was saying, if people make good arguments, you have to make good arguments against them. Like that's your job. And I took that to heart. Like he wasn't speaking to me, but he spoke to me. And I thought the simplest way of doing that was just making something that making work that people identified with making things that, I mean, I should really just start all the way from the beginning and just say, you know why I wanted to do this the way I do it is because I wanted to make work that people identified with, that people took ownership of, that people felt like when they saw me speaking, they could hear their own voice speaking in that way. And that would set off a chain reaction of people take work people that understand the work take care of the work mm -hmm. preserve the work the work endures you know graffiti is a really fleeting medium you know it's gone in hours and days and you know when in the 80s in philadelphia and new york you were right to assume that it could last for years but the best graffiti went the fastest it got the most attention it got the most heat on itself and you know, if it wasn't in a position of pride for the neighborhood and they took ownership of it, it got eliminated. So fundamentally, on a survival instinct, I wanted the work to last. The way to make the work last was to have people identify with it. The way people identified with it is it's just, to coin a phrase, relatable content, right? So it made sense for me to make work that made sense to people. When you say when you say you wanted people to relate to it, who who are people? Are people other graffiti writers or are people the general public? The people is the general public. Mm. You know, I painted 
my first real foray into the larger world outside of my neighborhood was I painted a stretch of Market Street in West Philadelphia from 63rd to 45th Street. It's maybe 20 blocks, maybe 30 blocks. And it's, um, it, it runs, there's an elevated train that runs down this Market Street. And on both sides of the elevated train, just perfectly situated, un, really unlike very few places in the world that I've seen, the, the rooftops are right at eye level to the person sitting on the train just looking out the window. And my brother, I have an older brother. He's four years older. Oh, man, he hated it. He hated the fact that I wrote graffiti. It was like such a threat to him and his worldview. And it didn't matter to me. You know, it was more than exciting to me to like be a ch to challenge him that way. But his girlfriend took the train every day to her job in the city and she saw my graffiti and she related to it and she's like a nursing assistant you know she's like as straight as it gets and she's as square as it gets and she's like i mean she's hip but she's like you know she represents society and and proper citizenry mm. and she's responding to my work and my work wasn't making any I wasn't making graffiti about dental assistance. I was like just painting my name, but the color, the placement, the energy spoke to her. And I realized it was speaking to everybody at some point. And, you know, I wanted to keep that going. And I wanted, sometimes I did it too much. Sometimes I did it too little, but that connection became the most valuable thing. Like that became the goal from, from the start. And, by having that goal, I was insulating the cable of power from the outside forces that wanted to cut it. You know, it was like, why do you think, um, well, one, do you think that graffiti has a utility, um, to the public sphere? And then two, why do you think that, you know, like the mun municipalities and just the society in general kind of has like a, such a strong backlash you're talking about philadelphia and how they had this whole thing against it even though it's such a big part of philly it is and, and the history of the city so um yeah so those are the two questions what do you think it has utility and why the such the strong backlash the utility of graffiti is to say i was here and it's to mark a time and a space that a person was present in a location in in the philadelphia context you know that's really the raison d'etre of graffiti in Philadelphia is I was here and I was here with this much style and I was here with this much attitude and joie de vie because we speak a lot of French in Philly. But the main, the main, main utility of graffiti is a declaration of existence. Now, related to that, the authorities hate graffiti so much because of that declaration. They hate that declaration. It's ironically in, in the city of the Declaration of Independence, people's, people declaring their existence is a really powerful threat. Mm -hmm. And it was fundamentally, it was on property lines. It was on, you know, Property holders, stakeholders, municipality just extended to the property. The people paying property taxes complained that their property rights are being violated. And they felt that for the money that they were spending on property taxes and everything else, they deserved to have their walls cleaned. So it became a really, it's interesting how angry people get at graffiti just on the strict sense of property damage. Like people have this very capitalistic notion of, I own this property, this property is mine. You defiling my property equals murder. Mm -hmm. It equals like the most murderous rage like a, a man can bring to bear, you know, possibly more than his family members, but probably the same amount as if his family members are being threatened. They really equate property value with it's the sanctity of life. It's a, it's a very confusing nexus 
that there's no way to talk people out of it. You know, what I did as a graffiti writer and later as like a writer and a spokesperson, you know, my own way is to say, you know, a mark on a property doesn't really commit damage, you know? I mean, there's a really interesting legal term that we'll get into, but paint on, landlords have been applying paint to walls for thousands of years to increase the value of their properties. It's like the first thing you do when it's time to sell your property is you paint the walls. So conversely, if Cornbread or Cool Earl apply a coat of paint to your wall, you'd be really hard pressed to explain how that is damaging the wall. Nobody's ever going to convince me that paint damages property because it does not damage property. It damages maybe your perception of your property, but it doesn't physically do anything to the property. In fact, it may strengthen it, it may add to it, it may increase its value, it may do a lot of things, but it's not damaging. So, but fundamentally, they call it damage, they call it, they wanna call it damage, they wanna call it destruction, they wanna, they wanna categorize it as something that is negative. And we had a very interesting few years in Philadelphia from like, the first article that was written on Philadelphia graffiti appeared in maybe 1970, 71, but like by, I think it's June or July of 1971, there is a full color magazine story in the Sunday magazine of the Inquirer. The Inquirer is our local, like our prestigious publication. It's our New York Times, but it's like, we have our tabloid, which is the daily news, like the post and the news in New York. The Inquirer is a little more August. It's a little more upscale. Um, right now, they're, they're all the same website, philly.com, philly.com. But when the Inquirer published this magazine profile about wall writing, not graffiti, wall writing in 1971, they, they cast the die that, you know, these are really interesting, dynamic creators that are changing their city, they're changing their neighborhoods, and they're changing themselves. The whole narrative was established in 1971. Two years before Taki in New York, the Taki spawns pen pals article in New York Times, and it made superstars out of Bobby Cool and Titty, and I forget who else. There was a couple other guys, but Cornbread was was front and center. They made these guys superstars, made them look cool, photographed them catching tags, set them up in a photo studio made them look glamorous they were glamorous they didn't have to do anything they wore their street clothes and their street clothes were marvelous but there was a an understanding editorially journalistically that these guys are really interesting they were doing something new and if you really analyze there's a great book called crimes of style um farrell i forget his first name but he really breaks it down. He does like a really important sociological breakdown of how like the media and the government work together to criminalize, they conspire to demonize and criminalize graffiti when it really is just a crime of style. It's a crime of like, it's not a crime. It's your opinion versus another person's opinion. And if you don't believe me, anywhere you could look for marketing or for any kind of like direction of where the youth is at, you're gonna see graffiti now. It's like a major part of our landscape now. Whereas for years, and I was on the front lines of it, you know, publishing a magazine, for years people were so mad about it, they didn't wanna depict graffiti, they didn't wanna show it in a positive light. They hated the fact that graffiti writers got good press. The fact that they called it graffiti was a way of them controlling it and making it something that you know, was in their control. The writers called it wall writing. You know, I still think wall writing suits, suits the purpose. I mean, I grew up in the 80s, so graffiti has a, a lot of appeal to me as a word and as an action. It's like, 
graffiti has utility to as a declaration of existence the authorities are really threatened by that declaration they do not want to see it's it's threatening for a few reasons you know and really like you can break it down any way you want but there it's a threat to uh, the prosperity and uh, peaceful well-being of the the government and the property owners of the municipalities how was it um back in that time period and when you had moved to new york and you were painting in new york as well as painting in philly how was it painting in that time period and how different do you think it is than like what we're in now and, and people painting now in terms of just i guess everything um when i when i was painting in philadelphia you know i started painting graffiti as a 16 year old and really like I, I kept at it until I was 30, you know, and so the first, I guess the first 10 years I did in Philadelphia and, you know, the, th there was activity, both legal, illegal. I, I, I try to keep a balanced diet in terms of like, you know, but by the time that I was like good and proficient at the craft, um, you know, I was drinking age. You know, I was voting age. I was definitely, like, f adult felony prosecuting age. So I was very mindful of the painting that I did. And I really try to, like, pick and choose my targets. And, you know, I guess the operating phrase when I painted was, I wanted to paint in a way that I could stand next to it and say, I did that and be proud about it. So that kept me out of doing a lot of dumb damage. You know, I kept... I, I really realized from an early age, like I had three sisters, you know, strong mother figure, and I didn't want to embarrass them. And they, I didn't want to like have unnecessary arguments with them. And the quickest, easiest way to avoid unnecessary arguments was doing stuff that I was proud of, that I could defend, that I could like stand next to and like smile about. So that was my main, my main focus was I didn't have to like, I didn't feel the urge to like be the most over the top bomber. I had friends who did. I didn't feel the urge to be like the relentless like route walker. I admired people who did. I, f I found this other path in the middle where it was, I'm gonna paint strategic locations, places that need a coat of paint, you know, and I'm gonna stand next to it and be proud of it. Like I had a funny, I would love to see this clip, but I had a news reporter try to buttonhole me and just like, and this is like growing up in Philly throughout the 80s was, you know, they would write stories, they would have news stories about graffiti like every four months. It was time to do like the, the big graffiti like expose on the local news. There's three major local news stations. There's like, two smaller like UHF news stations and there was like a couple of like major radio stations so I could talk to the press like three times a year and I did like there's you I could show you clippings of like anytime a reporter would stick a microphone in my face I would talk about graffiti and it would be my real name and the the graffiti name that was like people knew who I was like in 1992 so I wasn't fooling anybody. There was no like bandanas and like ball caps. I was just who I was. And anyway, this newspaper reporter was, or this television reporter, you know, microphone in your face, like, you know, what do you, how, did, how dare you, def I was like, hey, look, I, I've done nothing but good stuff everywhere in the city. I was like, you can find anything I've done in this city that you can point at and say that's a crime i was like i'll paint over it just point it out yo it took her a while but she found a tag like and it was so it was so great because it was like he said we weren't gonna find anything but look and the camera's like she's going down like a highway like off ramp you know like cars are buzzing by her and she's like look there's an espo tag right here and i was like oh i forgot about that one uh, i didn't buff it but i would have um but that was it was like but i 
took some reporter off her beat to like spend three hours like going to look at this. Like I talked to her at 11 in the morning and I could see by the angle of the light that she was in late afternoon in Philadelphia. It was amazing. So that was, I guess that's, that was my thing and that's my takeaway is, is you know, you're going to live a long life if, you, if you're going to live in society and you're going to make your mark on society then do it in a way that you, that you can be proud of. Do it in a way that you can defend or at least, you know, when, it, when it's time to pay the price for the work that you do, you can keep your head up high. That's, that's good, the goal. That's a, good, uh, that's a good statement in general. In um, general. And, and I, it's funny because um, when, I, when I look at your graffiti and I've been looking at it, you know, through the years and online and in books and, and photos and everything, I'm always like, yo, this dude's style is so like his approach to graffiti is a lot different than like the route walker or the bomber. It's usually about like mass quantity over time. Um, whereas yours, like e everything about it is different. Um, and it's just interesting to hear that that kind of originated, it seems from wanting to be able to show it to people and be proud and not feel like you're, I guess, like a plague upon society, which can sometimes be completely the opposite of uh, the approach to graph is like, I want to be a plague on society and I want to fuck up as much shit as possible, um, which is its own thing. But from what you're saying, it was like a completely different approach. Like I was watching some video on YouTube of you painting super, super long time ago. You're painting some gate. And I was like, let me look through the comments, see what people are saying. And uh, one person had said, I never do that. One, you never looked through the comments. <laughs> One person had said, uh, "I heard, uh, I heard that he used to go up to people, like go up to the, go up to the store owners and be like, you know, I'm doing this like exterior surface painting outreach, and then it would work like 80 percent of the time. Or if like cops came, I would tell them like, doing this whole thing, and like your just approach is so different. Uh, what can you say about that, or even just your methods of painting when you would go and paint? It it could be up to me as a motivate individual to make the world a different place by painting graffiti and you know painting over it in a way that made sense and how it made sense was you know using a four inch brush and painting the slats of of roll down gates and then at a certain point in time in the process transforming these plain silver gates with a few extra lines to say the name espo seemed pretty pretty innocent and pretty perfect uh, the the first time that i did it like i did it a couple times in kind of like small locations but the third time i did it was at the corner of sixth avenue and watts street if you know that corner it's the main one of the main feeds into the holland tunnel and the the spot that i painted is still there it's like still functioning it's now a restaurant but it's four gates and it's perfect height it's, it's only it's, it's head high but it's you know thousands of cars go by this corner every day i painted it on a on a nice balmy winter day you know the winter of like 97 or 98 was like super super balmy like all the way through like today like 50 degree days and i painted the spot but what was important about painting the spot was I started at two in the afternoon. I started about three in the afternoon. I had a shift at a bar around the corner, McGovern's, 305 Spring Street. It's still open if you want to drink. And my shift started at, at I think, five or six o'clock. So I started at two. I was going to wrap this thing up. I was going to go to my job. The thing about the corner of six and watts at this point in time at this point in history is they were dealing with major gridlock and the way that they were dealing with it was by having literally 11 cops like on the corner directing traffic writing tickets dealing with people just being a visual presence this was the time that i chose to paint these gates illegally and I was, in my mind, I'm painting my name, you know, regardless of like my, my quasi altruistic ambitions to make the world a different place 
and to remove the offending graffiti that I was covering my graffiti with. But it was literally painting illegally in front of 11 cops, unlawfully in front of 11 cops. And it was, without a doubt, stressful. It was a weird mental gymnastics I put myself through. But I pushed through and do, did it. At one point, I'm like, at the point where I, like, I'm putting an outline on the letters. An artist, writer, friend of mine named Reese, A-OK, is walking down the street. And he sees me painting like, hey, what's up, man? What's going on? I was like, I'm painting my name on this gate. And he, like, when he realizes what I'm doing, it, it looked, at first it looked like a, kind of a Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer kind of chore, like this guy's painting a fence. But when Reese, like, clocked the fact that I was, like, doing this illegal, wildly illegal thing in front of, like, almost a dozen cops, he got a look on his face of, like, like I was crazy. And he was crazy for even talking to me. And he just got off the block, like, instantly. And at that point, I really kind of lost my mind. I really started having real paranoid thoughts about everything. But it was cool as could be. Like, I finished completely. And I went to work. But a weird thing happened at work. Like, I had, like, real kind of post-traumatic stress seems to be overselling it. But every time the door opened, I, like, jumped. I, like, ducked behind the bar. It was stupid. It was, like, really, like, you know, I was kind of messed up for a couple hours after that. But turning that corner and realizing, like, okay, if I can do this in front of 11 cops and not get stopped, there's no stopping me. Like, there's no... There's no breaks to this thing. So I might as well do it and try and do it in every borough. And then I try to do it in every precinct. And I just try to do it until the wheels came off of it. And it took years. You know, it was finally like I had an incident on 149th Street that really was the end of it was I, I ran into just, the you know, I pushed my luck to the point where I finally found a landlord that was furious at I had the audacity to paint his gate. He was like so mad at me. And he wanted to give me a lecture about graffiti. And, you know, it was crazy because he's, this is, the, the guy is on the block where if you see Style Wars and Case is walking through his projects and Case goes into his building. I wrote about Case in The Art of Getting Over, rest in peace. I had the honor of going to Case's house and I spotted the gate like next door, like, oh, I'm gonna get that spot one of these days. And I did. And if I talked to Case about it, he would have told me like, don't go anywhere near that guy. That guy is like, and he told me afterwards, he's like, I would have told you. That guy's like the worst guy in the neighborhood, like just for everything. The guy, wanted to open up he had some reason he had problem with dominicans and he was like i'm gonna put all the dominicans in this neighborhood out of business with i'm gonna open up this bodega i'm gonna open up four more he had a huge plan and somehow me painting his gate was like a, a real wrench in the works mm. so he called the cops on me my mistake that day was i didn't leave my house with my id you know it was that time in new york when if you didn't have your ID, you were going to get thrown in jail or they were going to process you. And I really fucked up. If I had my ID and I told the guy, I was like, look, I'm doing this thing, exterior surface painting outreach, one person organization trying to make the world a different place. Like, what are you really mad at? Like, what's, I'll show you. I have a picture on my phone, not on my phone, my camera of what this gate looked like, you know? You could take the camera. You could see, like, this gate was covered with graffiti. He called the precinct. Here they come now. He called the precinct. I had another dozen cops in front of me. I had a, two. It started with two cops on scooters. And before you know, it was like the captain came. You know, there was a dozen cops just sitting there scratching their head about. And they know this guy from the neighborhood. But they also know he's like a capital A asshole. They don't know me. I'm a white guy far from home. And they were just like, they were trying to give me the benefit of the doubt. They really wanted to let me off the hook, but I didn't have ID. 
So it was like a long hour of trying to negotiate how this was going to work. And the cops are just telling the guy, like, let the guy go. Like, he didn't mean any harm. The guy's like, no, I want him prosecuted. And they're like, look, man, that's your fucking right. But, you know, we got bigger fish to fry. We got other things to do. Like, so what it came down to was they called my girlfriend and they, you know, they played a game on her to see if I was telling the truth. And she did the right thing, told them the truth. And they were like, okay, we know who you are. We believe, we believe you're telling us who you're saying you are. We're going to go from here, you know? So, of course, that just happened to dovetail with, you know, a few days, a week later, two weeks later, the cops are already circling, looking for me, putting the pieces together. They had, they had some snitches that gave them most of the information. But what they really needed was somebody to, like, put me at the place you know red-handed and they saw the the gate was like 75 percent done so they knew to talk to this guy and this guy like confirmed the information that they already had and the cops came to my house and they they searched my house after that and the guy like the guy called my house like hey man i just wanted to see how you the the bodega owner called my house like hey i just wanted to see how you were doing i was like you know how i'm doing He's like, look, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know they were going to. I was like, now you're apologizing? Like, are there all this? Like, and that's kind of how it was. Like, even at its worst, like I, like I said, going back to my original premise in the 80s, I was proud of the work I did. Like, me painting the gates is just another link in that chain of saying, I'm, this is good manual labor. It's of use to people. People now, they saw this covered gate covered with tags, and they hated it. And now it's at least uniform and it looks clean and it looks kind of graphic and interesting and they like it, mm -hmm. you know, like once the gates were done, I never got any complaints. Nobody filed any complaints on the gates once they were done. It was this one guy caught me in the act of doing it and he had a real weird bone to pick with the world. And so I paid for that. But there's if you look at the gate that's painted on the West Side Highway. I got stopped in the middle of painting the West Side Highway by the owner of the property. And all he wanted from me was, hey, could you paint do not park here like on, on this gate? And I said, I don't have a can of white spray paint. Otherwise, I would. He's like, whatever. He drove away in his BMW. And if you look at a picture of that gate, he painted do not park here. It looks cool. looks great. Better than I could have done it. I have a quote. Um, one guy I wrote with was a washed up graffiti writer that nobody had anything good to say about this guy revs. He loved that he was an outcast. He was doing this really unconventional looking graffiti and people hated it, but I loved it. I thought he was really interesting and had great ideas. I moved to New York to meet guys like revs and hang out with guys like revs. Um, so painting in New York and you're, and you're painting with revs and what do you, uh, have to say about that or anything that you'd like to share so for the first year in new york i didn't do anything yeah for the first 12 months of my existence maybe longer i just watched and waited and learned and tried to understand who was doing what and who the players were and the really the only person i knew like i mean i knew a few people but it was really interesting knowing revs at that time because Revs had roller tags, but Revs also had this like really sick Brooklyn hand style, very intricate, very interesting hand style that people didn't connect the two things. They didn't connect the Revlon that painted whole cars with the Revs that's painting these sloppy paint tags, you know? They didn't connect any of those dots. Like he was like, I could see he was doing work in two different divisions maybe two different you know uh grappling he was jiu-jitsu over here and muay thai over here but people didn't understand like he was doing these two different things and the the thing that was vis visible was the the sloppy roller tags and i loved them like they were they were in charge they were doing it and it was really fun hanging out with him and knowing you know, you're with 
you're hanging out with somebody who's like he's like a real blues musician or something and people just don't get what he's doing you know and you understand i understood that i was in the presence of like somebody that was like changing the entire game from like top to bottom and he was doing it with like two two pieces of steel and it was like amazing and it was a you know but he was also like you know he was a, a, a he, he was a gossipy, like, Brooklyn, like, graffiti writer. He loved, loved hearing the gossip. He, if he wasn't really ambivalent about computers, he would have been in the chat rooms, like, you know. But thankfully, he, uh, um, you know, he stayed on his own path. And um, I really enjoyed what I did was I didn't mind meeting people. I didn't mind talking to people. I liked chatting in the chat rooms and you know kind of nerding out on the possibilities that the world offered he didn't want none of it mm. like he didn't want to know about i wanted to tell him about he was like i don't want to know about like it's none of my business i just i want to know about me and i admire that too like i admire like you know okay he knows who he is he's staying on his own path he's digging straight through the center of the earth to get to the other side and he's going to get there me i'll circle the universe and i'll take the heights he'll take the depths and we'll compare notes like i figured i would go out meet people make compromises you know do a yin and yang of like taking possibilities taking chances failing and i would report back to him like i it felt great knowing that there was a guy that was so dedicated and so on his own track that he didn't need to make any of his negotiations with the outside world. I thought I could make the negotiations with the outside world. I'll be the person to navigate the the higher reaches of the art world and you know, I'll do gallery shows and I'll do commercial opportunities when they present themselves and I'll do, you know, I'll say yes to things that he would say no to. Mm. People would ask me all the time like will revs do x? Y, Z, and I would go and ask, like, do you want to do X, Y, Z? No. Okay. But I asked. It's, it's a good opportunity, and I understand. And, that, you know, it wasn't like I took any opportunities that were presented. People didn't want me instead of him. They wanted him, you know. Um, but it was, like, fascinating to, like, there was, like, one insane incident um, I, I published a book in 1999 called The Art of Getting Over. Shout out to Dana Alberella, St. Martin's Press. They, the clo a prominent clothing company used their uh, artwork from the book on T-shirts. And when I saw the T-shirts, they were $100 each. I had to buy all four of them. Um, I spent like the last $400 I had I think I, I missed rent that month and I bought these t-shirts and it took a year and a half but we got a major like six-figure settlement that I was able to split with all the parties and my friend my friend Phil Shock that that made made it happen and Rev's got a chunk of cash that it was like uh, blood money to him. He felt like this is like this crazy blood money that is tainted because it was, it's been touched by corporate interests somehow. And I forget what he ended up doing with it, but he did something like completely altruistic with it. Very like, you know, he went and donated to an animal shelter or something, but it was like, you know, that was like his mind state and it's still his mind state. Like he's like, you know, he's always going to be that guy and we're super proud of him. I mean, what's kind of amazing is like I've lived long enough to see like the world catch up to what he's talking about, you know, and it's, uh, and they, but they haven't caught him yet. Like mm. even now, like Revs is deeper into the ground than he's ever been. Like he's closer to the core of this planet than anybody can really realize so i won't spoil i won't spoil the surprise but um 
he's got a lot more gas in the tank. You know, I, I, I can't even, I'm speaking from like vague impressions. I don't have any specific <laughs> evidence of this, but I know it's funny because I'm at a point, I'm at a point in my relationship with him where it's like, I'm talking to intermediaries sometimes and just, I'm seeing their reactions to what he's working on. And I know what that is, you wow. know? So in terms of uh, your path within graffiti and, and painting, um, I believe it was in 99 is when you stopped writing graffiti. Um, why did you decide to stop? And was this a premeditated thing? Like, I'm only going to do this for so long. Uh, a lot of people, you know, often talk about how they're never going to stop and it's an addiction, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, you, you did stop. And yeah, so why did, why that? I wrote one word for 15 years. And then I set on learning to write with all the other words, you know? So I just expanded my vocabulary, like, from one word to all of them. And it's a, I feel like it's a necessary, for, for me, it's a necessary outgrowth. Like, it's a, I mean, I loved, I love graffiti so much, I had to let it go. But... It was time. It was definitely, and I think it's funny because I was in recently in Malaga, Spain, Malaga, Spain, and I was being approached by like, you know, lifers, like 30, 40, 30, 35, 40 year olds who were like, you still write? Like, you're not, you're not going to quit now. Why, why stop now? Like, you know, so there's a part of me that's like, yeah, of course, like I'll keep my hand crisp, I'll, you know. I'll make sure that the handwriting is as good as it's ever been. And if called, I'll serve. But it's not, it comes from a different place. It's more like, you know, being invited onto a stage and performing rather than I have to do this. I don't feel the, that deep compulsion, that compelling, like, need to be known. And I think that's, Listen, you write, to, you write to know yourself, you write so everybody knows you. And when you check those two boxes, then you decide, you know, what you need after that. But I think fundamentally, we write to say, I, will hear, I was here. And we write to make sure you're aware of that. And then after that, it's up, you know, maybe put some style into it. And then after that, when you, once you've done all that, then what? Well, yeah, that's, um, you know, pretty deep. Um, nowadays, you know, you're doing different types of words. You're doing all, all the words, like you said, rather than just one. And you just expanded your vocabulary. You're doing your thing. It seems like you have a lot of uh, projects going on and you're just always making something. Um, what uh, inspires you to keep doing this? Because although you don't, you're not like actively bombing or painting gates, in my mind, like in my weird vision, you're doing like the same like kind of idea, which is just like you're just creating for a purpose that's like deep within you and you're just, you're still doing it. Um, so what makes you, what inspires you to keep going and keep continuing doing a bunch of stuff? Every day is an opportunity, I think, to figure out who I am and where I am and illustrate that place on that map to look at and to see and get back to it the next day. Like, to me, it's like map making, you know? It really is like charting a, charting a course through life in as much as, an, as going the most interesting route possible. And every day is like another step in a direction. And you know, there's hundreds of people. I can see them in my feed and I can see them like all around just walking down the street. There's like hundreds of people that are making really interesting lives for themselves. Like the thing is when you, when you figure out a name for yourself and you become that name and you draw that name and you make that name for yourself, like you've just unlocked this like achievement of possibility that hopefully for you, 
it opens up more possibilities and opens up more achievement levels and more levels to unlock and it'll never end like it doesn't it doesn't have to end and it can get better and better and it may not even end in death like it may just keep going on and on it may have started before we even got here it's not even money it's just you know we're you're alive so show it you know be alive like the way to be alive is through action like action and the satisfaction from action that's life you know that's work some call it work some call it play but for me it's a it's that every act everything is a every mark is a prayer like every 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 everything like you do is a prayer and it could be you know you don't have to be an asshole you don't have to be like threatening people and talking negative about people and being salty about people because while that's funny and we we all kind of live for the confrontation sometimes it's also like it's a way of letting ourselves off the hook of actually doing anything you know we we get ourselves in these traps of like oh, i love looking at the drama i love looking at this bullshit that this person's saying and the trouble that they've gotten themselves into but that's to give us some relief from maybe we feeling like it's too much work to do and it's too much we haven't done enough and we haven't you know rather than do something it's easier to just to diminish somebody else than actually enrich our own lives and I get it, man. I like TV too, you know? I like I like the raps of 50 Cent. But I also like, you know, there's a lot of love in just, uh, you know, making a mark and uh, looking at it. Something you said earlier um, that, I, that I've been thinking about as we've been talking is uh, that you write, you said as a general statement, not necessarily for you, but uh, that you write to know yourself and then you also write to let the world know who you are kind of like that I was here type of thing. Um, but the interesting part to that is like the you write to know yourself part, which to me I find interesting because I've asked a lot of people like, why do you write graph? You dedicate so much time to this every day for years. Why are you doing that? And honestly, few people have like a firm answer like that, which I consider a firm answer. Um, and I think it's a really good answer because I think it's why a lot of people do a lot of things. Um, meaning to like, not just to show the world like who they are, showing their like style, but also just so they get to know themselves more, you know, just like you said in some other interview when you're talking about like having a child, like every day is an opportun opportunity for you to like learn and teach and learn about yourself. We're doing all of this like unpacking and packing and just every day, you know, learning. Yeah. And I feel like that's a huge part to not just writing and graph and art, but just everything that like everyone does. Um, and I'll give a quote from like uh, Miyamoto Musashi, who was this, he was just like this Japanese swordsman, legendary figure type of thing. And he says that the real value of martial arts is being able to use them so that they're applicable anywhere. And um, I think that that's the real value of like, you know, everything. Uh, so when I think of like, like meeting you today and like your style of being and then just your way of thinking, it makes total sense why you wrote the way that you wrote with like up your painting gates with a, with a fucking brush. Like who's doing that? Like no one's doing that. Like that's not even a thing you do. You know what I mean? It's actually the way to do it, but, but in, in graffiti, I mean, like no, maybe not painting with, you know, with Rusto, like, or revs, like the, what you just explained to him, like it's his whole, his method of approaching writing is his whole personality style. Like, it's not even like his method of approaching writing. That's just like him being alive and, and being who he is. And and I think that all of that is like really cool and inspiring. Um, yeah. I mean, what Revs, what Revs taught me, and like Barry McGee taught me too, is use the right tools for the job. You know, like both Barry and, and Revs use it to different ends, but they both admire, I think they have a, a healthy admiration for each other. And you know, Rez is all about, he's still all about like the correct tools for the job, you know, like, and he's got a wide range of like tools at his disposal. And it's like fascinating, like, you know, the most fascinating people I think you've had on your podcast are people that like, they go and they apply themselves in places and fields like far from the realm of marking and surfacing, you know, like, um, you know, I, 
I won't name names, but they know who they are. It's like that's the the gift that you have is like this is such an amazing practice of like you know you can go out with a can a marker and you can go out and have an adventure you you can definitely see a side of the world that very few people see you can win the admiration of your friends and your foes um even even like the the haters and and the authorities will admire you on some level and then you know once you've done that and you've mastered that why not go find out some other things that you could do like you're cheating yourself not like developing other tasks you know i what i said about sign painting was <laughs> when i learned sign painting i told another writer that you've had on on the podcast giant i said um it's fun to be a toy again like and it's it's it rewires your i think neural pathways to go and learn something and be terrible at it like you know the time that i spent learning jeet kune do or learning anything everything like picking up a scooter and busting my ass on it like it it keeps you young it keeps you growing and it keeps possibilities and you know it's so great to see it. Like, I feel like as an artist, I'm 54 years old, but as an artist, I'm a baby, and my best work is ahead of me, and I'm about to like make the greatest body of work I've ever made, and that's all possible because I've kept my my focus very narrow and my worldview very expanded. Like, I like to focus on small things. But I'd like to keep the possibilities open for, for like, big, big opportunities. And, you know, the world is just getting more interesting. It's crazy how, like, VRG chat and, like, the, the tools that are coming just on the horizon are insane. Are so insane. And, like, you know, it was such – it's been such a wild disappointment to see, like, NFTs, like, <laughs> in the precarious spot that they're in. Yeah. I mean, I really tried to, like – make something happen with it and i still think like i mean maybe there's nothing there but i think there's something there i believe there's something there but i think we're so hungry for like a new way to make work sell work own work process work share work really share work forget buying and selling and owning but just sharing like right now like these vehicles that we have for sharing work suck like instagram sucks like Twitter sucks, you know? Twitter's only getting worse. Um, Tumblr, we're all going to have to go. Let's all go back to Tumblr. Let's all get Tumblr popping again. I used to love Tumblr. I think it's, I think it's time to bring it back. I still have one, but I uh, just use it secretly. Right. My, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to fire up my Tumblr again. And, um, but, yeah, that's the thing. It's like what's cool about graffiti, what's always been cool about graffiti is connection, meeting, greeting, seeing receiving sending a message receiving a message like the best like the absolute best i can't believe graffiti's not played out yet like here we are in like the 50th something year of its like existence and it's like it's better than ever in some ways and it's better than ever in a lot of ways and um the possibilities are endless and i think uh i'm teaching i'm giving a seminar next week Quick plug at, uh, I don't know when this is going to air, <laughs> but I'm giving, a, I'm, I'm giving a talk at SVA and I'm going to touch on writing and I'm going to touch on um, penmanship because it's a, you know, it's a way of, of passing it along. It's a way of passing along information. Um, hopefully people will find information useful. And if, even if you don't find it useful, I think the act of saying like, hey, this is how you do this. This is an approach. This is the approach I take in doing these things. I think it's helpful. You know, let's face it. Our education system is in the toilet. Our leaders are not going to improve our educational system for our children, for our, for our loved ones, for our friends and family. We have to educate ourselves. Um, we can sm start in the small ways and the big ways, but 